Joe Riley is a friend and he's been on a couple of our videos. Joe's one of these guys that has shared with us as a group that he's got not only world-class LP little a levels, but also appears to have FH, familial hypercholesterolemia. So he and I have done a lot of work in that space. And he's one of those examples of how, you know what, you can have some major risk factors, but if you know what you're doing, you can prevent heart attack and stroke and remain comfortable that you can remain healthy. You just need to know. Hence, some of these webinars about people finding out, you know what, I had the major risk for heart attack and stroke. I had prediabetes. In fact, I had full-blown diabetes, but my dog didn't tell me, I didn't know. Now that I know, I know what to do. Anyhow, Joe keeps up with a lot of stuff and he sent me a couple of texts and emails and he got excited about this article and I'm so glad he did. I know Joe's watching. Thank you so much, Joe, for your contribution, the financial contribution you made a few minutes ago, but especially for this information. I've known that Pulse Ox was a big deal, especially for this issue, but just totally forgot to cover it. It came out in a New York Times article, the infection that's silently killing coronavirus patients. Now, why is it silently killing coronavirus patients? Well, it gets back to that comment that I made earlier. What's happening is that we're losing our oxygenation. Folks that get the SARS-CoV-2 infection and are going into the COVID-19 serious disease lose their oxygenation, but they don't lose their CO2. So what does that mean? Again, hopefully we can bring some more light onto that. Here's a quote from Richard Levitan, an ER doctor and the, the guy that wrote the article in the New York Times. We are not detecting the deadly pneumonia that the virus causes early enough and that we could be doing more to keep patients off ventilators and alive. In other words, if we detect this a little bit earlier, maybe we can prevent a lot of the death that's been going on and the visits to the ICU and the visits to the ventilator. And we all know once you start getting to that state where you have to go to the ICU and ventilator, your probability of surviving has dropped dramatically. So Levitan, Dr. Levitan in the ER observed this, almost all the ER patients had COVID pneumonia. Even patients without respiratory complaints had COVID pneumonia. So no complaints, but still an infect pneumonia infection in the lung. As we reported earlier, and the folks have reported all the way back to China in the early days of this pandemic, they were seeing what's called ground glass findings on the chest X-ray, even in kids. And the kids were not dying from this. They're still not. This is not something that's a virus that's attacking kids, but still a huge number of kids are showing ground glass. What that means is whether we're aware of it or not, this virus does attack our lungs. It's just very silent and stealth in terms of its attack. It's like a ninja. So these patients didn't report any breathing problems. Chest x-rays showed that diffuse pneumonia, that ground glass appearance, that's what we were referring to in that earlier article. Their oxygen was below normal. So pulse ox and the silent infection that's killing us. The normal pneumonia, we've got a comparison here on this, these two pneumonias, a normal pneumonia on the left versus COVID pneumonia on the right. Regular pneumonia or quote normal pneumonia is an infection of the lungs in which the air sacs fill with fluid or pus. That's, it happens from some bacteria. It can happen from viruses as well. You get discomfort in your chest. You get pain with breathing. You get other breathing problems too. You're coughing. You keep coughing up stuff and it feels like you just can't get all that stuff up. And typically you'll get a significant fever, especially if it's bacterial pneumonia. If you look back at some of the significant problems in the history of medicine, when you talk about the discovery of penicillin, that was the big life-saving component because prior to that, streptococcus pneumonia was killing a lot of people. It was one of the major causes of death. After the development of those antibiotics, that became a thing of the past. So back to the, to the script and the bullets here. Most patients requiring emergency intubation are in shock. They have altered mental status or are grunting to breathe. It's like this. 
you're pushing against your, you close your glottis and then you push and that helps increase the pressure inside your lungs so you can inflate those lungs again. Now let's talk about COVID pneumonia. COVID pneumonia causes a form of oxygen deprivation called silent hypoxia. And it's silent because again, they're not detecting it. We typically detect quote hypoxia, not because it's hypoxia or low oxygen. We typically detect it because our CO2, carbon dioxide is increasing. The brain driver, the nucleus in the brain that tells us to breathe, tends to be more driven by elevating CO2 than decreasing oxygen. So again, something to think about as we think about this, the mechanism for this disease. So patients don't feel short of breath for days or even as the oxygen levels are falling. They'll talk about in the ER, patients have incredibly bad oxygen levels, but they're sitting there work, waiting for a room and they're working on their cell phone as if nothing's going on. By the time they begin to understand it, they already have alarmingly low oxygen levels and moderate to severe pneumonia based on the x-rays that we discussed, that ground glass appearance. Patients requiring intubation are even using their cell phone. So they have a low oxygen level as low as 50%. And the normal range for oxygen level is 94 to 100%. We start getting worried in the low 90s. So now you're beginning to get an understanding when you compare that to 50% oxygen levels, helping you understand how this is a very serious issue, but it's sneaking up on people. How does this happen? Well, the coronavirus attacks lung cells that make surfactant. What is surfactant? It's sort of like an oily substance. It helps the air sacs or alveoli in the lungs stay open in between breaths. It creates, it, it, it uses what we call surface tension. You know, when you drop a, a drop of water on the table and it'll ball up, that's surface tension. Surfactant creates surface tension within our lungs. So, even though we exhale, we still, the alveoli or the air sacs still remain open. COVID inflammation causes air sacs to collapse and oxygen levels begin to fall. The lungs initially remain compliant. Now, what does that mean? It means you just saw me sigh. I can move my rib cage easily. And when they become non-compliant, it can be for scarring. That's more of a chronic issue, but on an acute basis, it's usually due to lungs filling up with fluid. So early on, you get this drop of oxygenation, but the lungs are not full of fluid yet. So the patient doesn't understand, the person doesn't understand. I'm not having trouble breathing, but I'm not aware that my oxygen level's going down. They can still expel CO2, they don't feel short of breath. And that was what I referred to a few minutes ago. You don't get this increase in carbon dioxide, so you don't feel it. Patients compensate for the low oxygen by breathing a little bit faster and deeper and then faster and then deeper. And that's the silent hypoxia. That breathing fast and deep causes inflammation and it causes air sacs, irritation, inflammation of the air sacs. It causes the body to start. We get hypercapneic. You ever hear that term? Again, just a fancy medical term. What it means is decrease in CO2 levels. So as you get decrease in CO2 levels, that's when you start getting a little bit nervous and jumpy. So in effect, what's going on is the patients are injuring their lungs by breathing harder and harder. Now, 20% of COVID pneumonia patients go on to develop a second deadlier phase of this lung injury. The fluid begins to build up, lungs become stiff, the carbon dioxide now begins to rise because you can't ventilate anymore. Then they develop acute respiratory failure. So that's what's going on. There was a JAMA article recently on what the top five of the first five, 5,000 patients, consecutive patients that were admitted to New York. And out of that group, they talked about 20% of them, I think was going on into ICU and a high level of those dying. So, Again, what you're beginning to see is some parallels of what we've already discussed here in what's called pathophysiology, patho meaning disease, physiology, how it works. 
So how does the disease work for this? First of all, you get an infection. Most people don't get a significant problem with it, but some people, as in maybe up to 20%, we don't know yet because we don't know the denominator, but some people start losing their ability to oxygenate. As they do, they get into a cycle. Portion of those folks get into a destructive cycle that ends up injuring the lungs. Now, by the time the patient gets fluid buildup, the lungs become stiff, the CO2 rises, and they develop this respiratory failure. Oxygen levels are now dangerously low. That's when you start seeing those oxygen levels, 50%, 60%. Patients will require an, a ventilator. And again, you typically ventilate a patient at significantly higher levels than that. Many patients are not going to the hospital until COVID pneumonia is already well advanced. So as we discussed before, it's because they're not noticing that hypoxemia, that decreased oxygen. Many wind up on ventilators causing shortages of machines. And uh, once on the ventilator, many die. So that brings up another point. It's a recurring theme that you've heard from many people, and that is that ventilators are killing people. That may be the case. Here's what, what I'm thinking currently. I'm thinking it's what's always been the case. By the time somebody needs a ventilator, they're in very, very serious condition already. So what is pulse ox and how can that help? It helps to identify patients with COVID pneumonia earlier and then treat them more effectively. One way is through pulse oximetry. What is pulse oximetry? It's a way of monitoring the blood oxygen level. And you see pictures of it here on the right. So this is a way to know whether somebody's developing silent hypoxia, provide early warning of COVID pneumonia. It displays both oxygen saturation and you get a pulse rate with most of these. So who should have this? Well, all patients tested positive for coronavirus should be monitored and all persons right now with a cough, fatigue, and fever, even if they have not been tested or even if they had negative results. I think right now, it's a good idea to keep an eye on your pulse ox. Now, we had some discussion when Joe originally brought this up last week, and I made, again, an offhanded comment that Janice had told me these things were no longer available. I have been meaning to get one for a while. It's just that we don't use them. We're mostly focused on prevention. But when the coronavirus came up, I thought, gosh, it'd be nice to have one of these. And I just never got around to setting it up. Janice told me when I started to look, they're not available. Then we had some back and forth with the comments. I looked and sure enough, you can get them now. You can't get the $20 ones. I think they're out. But I found several of them on Amazon for like 50 bucks. There's nothing like a community. We saw that in the Louisville event. People got together and started talking about how they've had challenges and successes in preventing their own heart attack, stroke, or chronic disease. It became very clear that you don't have to be a doc with a full-time 30-year career in preventive medicine to understand this and successfully prevent heart attack, stroke, the number one killer and disablers of people. You don't have to be a physician to prevent eye disease, uh, kidney disease. All you have to do is think, listen, and become part of the community. Now, how do you do that? Go to the membership login on our webpage, and as you can see, you can get right in. You have, you have to sign up if you haven't signed up already and I've already signed up, I've already gone in. It's very simple, very uh, easy to understand. In order to help encourage this, after the success and the positive emotion, the positive impact that we're seeing with these events, we're saying, look, we need to offer more of these services for free in order to help grow this community. So you'll see us starting to do drawings for the webinar event, the courses. We've got a book coming out in, a, in about a month uh, we'll be offering that. Even full-blown evaluations, providing those uh, for free for folks that, again, help us grow the community. So if you'd like to find out what the most recent rules are for the most recent drawing, just come to the membership page. Thank you for your interest.